Guys, welcome back to the Iron Roots Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Evanesh, and Iron Roots is brought to you by Play. We're literally 30 feet away from the highway, and we're here at the famous York Barbell Hall of Fame Museum, and right here is the York Barbell Company. Through these next few episodes, we're gonna be taking you inside the York Barbell Hall of Fame Museum, showing you photos, sharing stories and interviews about iron history greats and a new friend that I get to interview. So get your protein shake ready, whole milk, bananas, ice cream, old school style. These next few episodes are gonna be the best ever. This is Plays Iron Roots, a podcast dedicated to uncovering the strength legends, the training methods, and the stories around physical culture and iron history. I'm your host, Zach Evanesh. Grab yourself a protein shake, chalk up, and prepare to travel back in time to some of the most awe-inspiring stories of iron history. It's go time. On this episode of the Iron Roots Podcast, Zach continues his conversation with Jan Dellinger at the York Barbell Museum. What were, um, you know, some of the, when you saw him training also in the gym, so he'd squat, he'd overhead press dumbbells. What are some other things that you recall? A lot of those, uh, like, pullovers, yeah. but not with heavy weights. He, he did them. But Barbell or dumbbell pullover? Uh, dumbbells. And, you know, there's also an exercise that's similar to that. We call dislocates where you kind of, you know, bring bring them around with dumbbells. Yeah. So he would do like arm circles with the dumbbells. Yeah, and uh, sometimes oh, he also we had a cable uh, that was uh, attached to the wall. Right. And there was a, a loading pin that you put weights on, and then we had a long garden hose. Uh, there was a cable inside the <laughs> and attached, and he would get to the other side of the platform. This was you, yeah. this was like three quarters way across the gym, and he would row that, uh, you know, the, the garden hose as we called it. Uh, he, you know, he would start out at, you know, 150, 60 or something like that and row it several times. Then he'd throw about another 25 or 30 on it. And I saw him do as much as 240 uh, for several, like seven, six, seven, eight reps. Right. Uh, again, some days he'd stop at 230. Some days, you know, it just depends what he felt like. I mean, these were not like calculated plan workouts. Like, he just went by feel. He yeah, was, yeah, was, yeah very holistic. Yeah, he was just, he's getting some exercise. Uh, so that was another one. Once in a while, you'd see him do some. He'd walk over to the. We had a squat rack, that iron staircase. Yeah. Somebody'd leave 315, 405 on it, and just walk over there. And he'd shrug it, you know, a few times. And then he'd walk around and did a lot of leg extensions. Um, he thought that strengthened your knees. That's why he also did quarter squats. He read out, talked about. Uh, it strengthens your attachments and things like that. Right. Um, the leg, leg extensions. For a while there, was only, we had a, a universal gym in the uh, you know the circuit piece sure. in the gym. He was leg pressing those those. Uh, yep, I he, remember that. He did the stack. He, he would he would start in the bottom pedals and do the stack, and and then he put it. Sometimes I even change put it down. He feet up on the upper one, and he yeah. Do, I, that used to be in a lot of the high school weight. I mean, it was in my high school when I started in 1989. They were slowly getting into it as I was getting out of high school. Yeah, the universal gyms were sold yeah. uh, to, to uh, high schools, colleges, the safety thing. The safety thing, right? Yeah, nobody's going to get hurt. The weight can't fall on you. Just you don't, let, don't get your finger in the weight stack yeah. and you know, <laughs> you're going to lose those keys and you know one thing and another. I'm sure it happened to somebody. Right. Uh, but you know, I saw him do that. Uh, saw him do some hyper extensions every once in a while. Once in a while, he would just. Uh, I saw him do like stiff legged good mornings. Now not all the way down, but uh, he he did them to at least parallel. Sure, those photos of him doing that legs fully locked uh, straight with like ninety five pounds. I'm talking about when he's you know sixty five, seventy right. years old. Uh, and he just sort of wandered around the gym and did stuff. You know, yeah, that, that was sort of his workout. Interesting. So, you know, let's, you know, we're here at York Barbell. This is all kind of the creation and brainchild of Bob Hoffman. And we were talking, I think we recorded it a little bit, is that Bob was very entrepreneurial. And before he even, so he had the magazines, he had York Barbell equipment. He's traveling, he's got supplements. Um, I, I, yeah, he didn't have 
didn't have something. He didn't have something, but well, I'm talking like his whole umbrella of things that he had. Yeah. But he started as it was like oil. You were saying? Well, he, like I said, he, his uh, brother Charles, I think it was, and a guy named Snellbaker owned a York oil burner company. Oil burner. This is like as World War One was coming to an end. Uh, when Bob got out of the service in World War One, he came here to York uh, and got into the business with his brother. Now, I don't know if he was like a full partner, but I do know he was like a root salesman because those things were touchy, I was told, and you had to service them. So Bob would, you know, and, and sell them too, you know, so he was kind of sales and service oriented. He also carried a 105 pound barbell along with him in his car. Who, where was that barbell from? Do you know? Did he make Probably it? Milo. Milo. Although I don't know, it could have been made here because the Eisterweiser foundry was down the street from the oil burner company and, and or what became York Barbell, uh, the original York Barbell company. And there was a guy in the York Barbell, the oil burner company at the time uh, named Ernie Zimmerman who came over here from Germany. Ernie was a junior national European champion in Germany so he, and he was a craftsman. He, knew, he made a six foot bar for Bob, which I told you they took on uh, those exhibitions and things when they barnstormed. Now that's a little later. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Bob, uh, so it could have been made at the oil burner company. Uh, I should have brought along some York oil burner letterhead. Well, I, saw, um, I don't know if it's the letterhead, but on one of the platforms it says... Um, yeah, it's, it, that was the logo, right? Yeah. Now this was a little bit different. Uh, but anyway, there, uh, Bob would stop along the road and, and get his 100 pound, high pound barbell out and you know do some exercises and and Bob was a sportsman. I mean, he was very good at the handball, apparently fairly decent at boxing, and, and some of those other, you know, games. Rowing, right. always a bear on rowing, you know, so uh, either individually or in a crew. But uh, so he was, he was athletically inclined. Uh, but that's, that's kind of how he got started. And then uh, he decided he wanted to get into Strength and Health mag or a magazine. Yeah, so I'd I, love I, to hear how that. Strength yeah. and Health was the first magazine? Yeah. And then later was well, muscular they, development. They had, they had mus he bought he it, my, Milo Barbell was was out had <clears throat> various iterations of Strength Magazine. It, yes. it, it was Arena and Strength for a while. There were some yep. iterations of titles. Anyway, uh, I think he thought there was room for another magazine. So he, I know, in 1931, he uh, was starting to get this magazine itch. He got in touch with George Jowett. They met at a football game, at uh, University of Pittsburgh football game, in about November of 1931. And about a week or two later, Jowett's here in York, helping Bob get his business going. Is that because Jowett had his booklets? He had like his mail order yeah, um, but, courses? Well, he, he had been one of those mail order course guys. And uh, I, it's hard to tell. Maybe they were looking at, uh, I have often wondered why a guy who was established would team up with Bob. But you gotta remember, the depression is starting. Maybe there's like a hedge or something. I don't know. But anyhow, right. but he, there, I've got the correspondence I can show you. Where uh, Jowett, he met at a football game, and a week or two later, he's here. Jowett's answering mail. Jowett's issuing, you know, things because Bob was getting neglecting his oil burner business. And I, I think I told you he had a tire business here. Yeah. And then at some point, and I don't know exactly when, he owned uh, the. Uh, Hotel King George, mentioned. King George Hotel. On, on so yeah, real interesting to hear how entrepreneurial he is, and also talking about like the magazine and George Jowett's like mail order courses. So even when I started getting into training in the late '80s, they they still had mail order courses, and there was something so like special about going to the post office, getting a money order, and then waiting for that thing to come. Like the secret to yeah. big calves. I remember the first money order I sent in. I didn't know it meant you go to the post office. So I just took cash and put it in there. And I remember calling a company saying, oh, I did a money order. She's like, okay, where, what was the number on? I go, I just put in $7. She's like, honey, she's like, somebody went out to lunch with that $7. And I was like, I'm waiting for my big calf course. Ironically, <laughs> even when I started working here at York Barbell in the middle of the late 70s, we still had a quite a few people that sent cash. And then, did, how did that work? Did people go out to lunch with the money or send the courses? Uh, usually, the, the, well, one person did, uh, but 
when you're a girlfriend of Bob's, uh, you know, that you can get away with that. Uh, anyhow, it was, yeah, it, there were still people doing that. Right. And uh, there's, there's a couple of unusual customers we had. I won't go into that. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, but, well, in my, my case, I uh, used to follow professional wrestling when I was right. like in uh, middle school. Yep. And I, I used to see Bruno San Martino. He was, he was a champion. Right? Yep, with the big chest. Yeah. Big, big, big. Big everything. Yeah. He was yeah. built like a house. Right. And I wanted to be Bruno. <laughs> and I was reading these wrestling magazines. I'd, I'd walk up a railroad track. I wasn't supposed to. I was I had 10 or uh, how old would you be? 10, 11, something like that. And uh, I was told not to go uptown and redline, but I did. And anyway, so I would go up to the cut rate drugstore and look through these wrestling magazines. Well, I'd, I had enough money, I'd buy them, one, and I'd take it home. And I saw this, I'm going through the ads, saw this Bruno San Martino bodybuilding course. So, I th okay, so I saved up enough money, whatever it was, and sent away for it. Got the thing, I don't know what I thought was going to be, I guess I thought it was calisthenic stuff. Um, but I saw some posed pictures, you know, like the chest shot, side chest shot, right. and a few things. Like, wow, I got to have this. So anyway, I got this thing back, and darn you know it had it had some body weight exercises, those Indian squats and and, uh, and the dip, the floor dips, and yeah, and uh, little little suggested a little running, and anybody had the barbell, like six barbell exercises. Oh heck, now I got to get a barbell, you know. So my parents weren't real thrilled about that. But anyway, um, I kind of got started the same way. Yeah, those mail order courses, yeah. it was because now we have access to everything. <clears throat> Back then, we right. wanted to know, what did Bruno San Martino eat? Like me asking you about Grimmick. Yeah. You know, what was he eating? What was that like? And there was something inspired. There's still, to me, it's very inspiring to find out what you did not know about how that person would eat, how that person would train. Well, like I said, Grimmick, <clears throat> Grimmick said that the... He, he said if, if, if you would feed a kid today like he was fed he said they'd probably have you jailed but he said the biggest bonanza to him was when he got that job as a soda jerk and got exposed to milk on a regular basis right he said i drink like a quarter milk he said just about every time i drank a quarter milk before a workout which is i wouldn't but but you know when you're young sure he, young. he, he, he said i'd break some record even the press or the curl or something like he said i, I squat or he said deadlift he said i would break some sort of record he said the milk was just really helping. He said that in the leg work. You know what's also interesting, Jan, about those courses is that it was like always a common theme. It was always about like, you know, eating a lot. It was about hard work. It was about adequate rest. They never really used the term overtraining. They would say things like you got to get, they spoke about stuff that like doctors speak about today, like sleeping nine hours. Like those courses always spoke about you know, the, the, the meals, the sleep, the catching a nap, that stuff is like a hundred years old, but now like we have doctors like doing sleep studies, like yeah, yeah. they knew a hundred years ago that yeah. if you don't sleep, you're not gonna get big or strong. There's nothing really new under the sun, <laughs> yes. if you stop and think about it, other than the <laughs> pharmaceutical industry. But yeah, it, it, it's, they had this figured out a long time ago. Right. And, and, and again, if, if you followed those, well, let's say the Milo courses or the York courses, which are very similar, and uh, the assumption was you wouldn't be overtraining. Now, Grimmick <laughs> said it when he was started training, he said, my brother wasn't right, so I started misreading the directions. He said, I thought they meant to train every day, and on that third workout, you up, up your, your curl, your squat, whatever, by a couple right. of reps. He said, so a couple of weeks today, I said, I'm shot. Because he was training every day. Normally, it was like a three days a week. He, he said, I was doing the whole course six days a week. And he said, so I went back and read the direction. <laughs> oh, it's every other day. Every other day. He said, so then once I, once I, we said, once I got into that rhythm, he said, yeah, it started happening. Yeah, I, I think that's, I still think that stuff's great. Like you train hard, the next day you have a day off. Then you, yeah. you know, I, I, the big thing today is like doing a lot of volume, but I just found that that like every other day style of training, getting that adequate sleep, that, that stuff. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, that stuff's great, and full body workouts are still great. And the other thing too, I should be considered is when he when you started those Milo courses in the 1920s, 30s, your lifestyle in general was a little bit more work oriented. Sure, people weren't you. Most people weren't sitting behind a typewriter. That's right. In fact, that was considered if you were sedentary. That was as a job. That was considered like 
eh, not good. You, know, you should be up moving around, working. Right. Farmers, you know. It, it was Farmers, like, kids had, you know, I had two paper routes. Yeah, one yeah. in the morning, one after right. school, or I mowed lawn. So, right. the, you know, the, the well, this is what was running through my mind too, Jan, speaking of that and being more um, movement oriented is looking at the advertisements in the magazines, it, what hit me was that a lot of them were for gaining weight or gaining oh, muscle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was very few, or I don't recall any, that was like, you're fat, you need to lose weight. Now, so much of it is about fat loss, yeah. weight loss. And even my buddy said to me, he goes, you know, I was looking at an old Evil Knievel video from like the 70s. He said, there's not one overweight person in the crowd. As, as we became more <clears throat> technologically oriented, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, we sit more, we, we don't get up and move. If it's, it's that, what is it, inertia? In, in science, you know, a, a body or a thing that's at rest tends to stay, stay at rest. Stay at rest, yeah. yeah it, it, it's that. And then the less you do, it's almost like the less you want to do. Right. I mean, even the old farmers, you know, when they weren't actually physically baling hay or stuff like that or, you know, forking manure. Yeah, I did some, I'm out in the agriculture, I did some of this. Uh, they were walking around, walking over the fields, checking the crops, pulling weeds here it, and there. It was, a phys it was a physical day. Thank you for supporting the Iron Roots podcast brought to you by Play. To see this episode and all the other educational resources brought to you by Play, go to play.pro, P-L-A-E dot pro. You're going to love it, and we'll see you next time.